Hello ladies and gentlemen, my name is Man the Maker, and welcome to a new Let's Play series for Stellar Monarch, a Grand Strategy Empire sim Emperor 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 Simulator, I would kind of call it. They describe it as an asymmetric space empire builder where you feel like the Emperor and not a logistics officer. Indeed, indeed. We make directives. We don't build things. We we it, it's kind of a little bit more offhand. It's also a bit fast paced because of this. There's a lot less micromanagement that goes into the game. Um, and actually, I was I was reminded to play it because I've been following the development of I have forgotten the name of that game already. Um, Alliance of the Sacred Sons, which looks incredible to me. And uh, in that one, you kind of play as the emperor. Though the games are quite quite different. But I was like, you know what? I want to be an emperor in space. And so uh, I actually requested a key for it and the developers gave one to me. And so here we are. Um, let's go ahead and just dive on in. I have played the game for about six hours. So I'm not a master, but I'm also not a complete beginner. And this first episode, we are going to spend a lot of time explaining the mechanics of the game. If you are super experienced in the game and you don't, you know, you might want to skip ahead maybe even to the second episode because we're probably going to spend this whole one uh, setting up and describing things though you will miss of course then the setup and the the kind of initial moves that we're going to make um, as we go through things so let's just go ahead and dive into the game we're going to start with glory of the emperor empire right this is how you start you can start very small normal a large empire but in the decline and with rebellion we're going to just we're basically going to do default normal difficulty i'm playing on a smaller system than um or a smaller size than the normal uh, just to make the game a little bit shorter. And um, also, we're going to do... Actually, does that make the game shorter? I'm not sure it does, considering... Yeah. Yeah, we're, we'll go with small. It's fine. Um, we're going to go with the old Empire. Fine. Okay, you know, this is just the default. We're going to go into Create Emperor as well. Here you get to kind of pick how you can do it. I've already selected this. Um... And, you know, I mean, a lot of this, if you look over, you can kind of have an idea of what they do. But we're going to start with sociology, technologies, imperial officers, starting with loyalty, because loyalty is an important part of running an empire, and a little bit of extra money. Um, I'm not going to go too far into this, into my decision making here. It will become apparent as we go further into the game, though. Um, and let's just go ahead and start. Clone a new emperor. Boom. Here's the map. That is the entire uh, galaxy, I guess we could call it. Um, and um, we start right here in the middle of everything. And we've got some neighbors, right? We can see over here, we'll, we'll get to that and who they are, but every different color is a different group. And we're right here in the middle with our capital of Terra right in the start. So what is the first thing that an emperor needs to do? You need to reshuffle your court. Let's go into the empire tab and look at our court. The most important thing here is to have a balance between the five factions of gene, gene technologists, warlords, cancelists, economists, and traditionalist factions. Now, whoever has the most, you get certain benefits on that. That's all well and good, but that's kind of secondary to me. Um, if you have them out of whack, then you're going to have more rebellion problems. That's the shortest way that I can describe that. The second thing that you want to do... Oops. Shaking my whole desk here. Um, the second thing that we're going to want to do is kind of reshuffle where people are. We need to keep it within a certain balance. But we want to have in the top positions people who are competent and loyal and low in corruption. And we have a limited amount of resources in which to gain that. So the first thing we're going to do is look at who is competent and loyal and low in corruption. You are great. You are not very competent but very loyal. Not very competent but very loyal. Competent, not loyal, very corrupt, very corrupt. Competent, loyal, and not corrupt. You're you're a great guy. Um, very low competency and loyalty and high corruption. So you're also somebody who we want to get rid of these two. I would like to get somebody in who's a bit better here. Um, like for example, you high competency, high loyalty, low corruption. It's pretty nice. We kind of want to get rid of you. Get rid of you. Get rid of you and get rid of you. Actually, there's a lot There's a lot of reshuffling that we're going to kind of need to do here. Because um, you're just, you are just incompetent. Now, what's interesting is these all have effects based on their competency, whereas you do not. 
So all we want out of you is somebody who is loyal and low in corruption. Like you, for example. So just moving this guy over to there is a pretty good idea. And we're going to do that. We only have a certain amount of points. So we are going to do that. And then, we I mean, we're going to end up firing you for sure. So what I'm going to do... We're going to move you all the way to the right. It costs one political point to move them up, down, left, or right. And we only have eight. So we're going to move you to... From Treasury to Internal Affairs. No, I clicked on the wrong one. No. Justice to the right, to the right, to the right. Great. Now we have somebody who's incompetent but is loyal and low in corruption. And now we can trade you guys... Frankly, I would not mind another blue person. Like you, for example. You are quite good. We need to get rid of you. And we can ditch the green guy. I actually don't need a green one here at all. I'm going to move you to the left and I'm going to move you up. And then we can get rid of you. Okay. You're going to move to the left. Internal Affairs. And I'm going to promote you. This is going to get us a little bit more balance here. Which doesn't really matter. I mean, the green has enough that it's going to be fine. We get somebody who's very competent and loyal up into the top position. Promote, promote, promote. Uh, what? The hell just happened? <laughs> Did I move, move you down one or something? I'm not really sure what occurred there, but okay. We still want to kind of get you out and we still kind of want to get you out. But I'm out of political points, unfortunately. I would love to have been able to swap you guys, but unfortunately that will not be the case. Unfortunately, having somebody incompetent in treasury is going to hurt us a little bit. Yeah, you're not so incompetent. Okay. So we've got we've done the reshuffling a little bit. Corruption, by the way, uh, costs us money. Basically, you're just we're just going to lose money. Um, next, on to edicts. So here we kind of make our emperor empire-wide decisions that will affect everyone and everything. Um, for example, our freighter. How do we allocate free freighters towards colonization? It's cheaper to colonize, or we make it so that we explore more often, or more money per planet per turn. More Imperial Communication range. We're going to leave that one to the side for now. Twice faster recalling of Stormtroopers. You use them to invade planets, basically, and you have a limited supply. Um, justice. We can have just governors or magistrates. People's Court. I like this changing this one because it goes from no bonus to an actual bonus. Schools. Focusing on loyalism, happiness, and loyalty. We like a lot. Research. Uh, point defense weapons. Ground combat. Or better relations with civilized. Interesting. You can change your army, focusing on firepower, morale, invasion progress, palace guard to protect the emperor because we are an individual here, or military police, additional security rating. We're not going to change that either. Industry, bonus to farms, mines, refineries, factories, or services. We start off with agriculture. And then administration. Basically, all governors start with additional competence, less corruption, happiness, or communication range. Now, it's interesting because every time within an era, and an era will last for 30 turns, it gets more expensive to change these. So really, we can only change two of them off of the bat. And the ones that I'm going to change, I'm going to go from agricultural to refining right away. And we'll figure out why. Just know it, it gives you 25% to refineries output. We'll get to what that does in just a moment. Um, but suffice it to say, this is what I like to do. And then I'm going to change one more. And it's kind of between the basic admin or changing uh, to education. Now, this goes from no bonus to a bonus, whereas this one just changes a bonus to a different one. 3% research points per turn, I do like quite a bit. Same thing over here, going from no governor to a governor. Um, having more planet loyalty, more happiness, more money per turn. I think I would just rather have more competent or less corrupt governors because we are with 19% corruption right now. 
And new governors, well, well we're not going to have new governors right away, are we? Maybe. All right, I'm convincing myself. Competence or corruption? Competence or corruption? We're going to go with competence. Actually, this doesn't make so much of a difference right away. Not true. Done. Because we are going to be taking planets early on. Then we have intelligence. Here we can see um, our neighbors. There are major races, the Sha'a monarchy, who are here. And we share a border with. We share two, two planets. The Antarians League, who we also share. Oh, no, that's not them. Where are you guys at? Over here. We do not share a border with the Antarians League. Interesting. And the Thale Republic, who we do. They are by far the largest. So we have to be a little bit careful of them. 79% of the galaxy is underneath their control. Um, I The one part of the game that I really haven't understood so well is the diplomacy. Um, I really didn't play around too much with that. So... This is going to be the lightest uh, description that we have. And then how these can t kind of... But basically, I think we're not going to want to mess with the, the big guys. These guys we don't care about. These guys, we border them. We're probably not going to want to fight them initially. So we're not going to worry about them. Then you got minor races. These guys are just much smaller. You can see they only have seven, nine, eight, nine planets compared to our 45 and etc. Um, do we border any of them? We do. We border the Narwag. We border the Zorari. And I think that's it. Potentials to be friends. Potentials uh, to uh, go to war with as well. Um, probably what we're going to want to do is go to war with one of them early on. And then be friends with the other. But we'll see. The Talmac. Where are you, Talmac? Is it you? Yes. Okay, we actually border all of them. We do border all of them. Okay, so we can kind of decide we want to go. Then we have basically the primitive. I mean, people that you're always going to be fighting. The rebels and pirates, they don't own anything. Fine. Parasites have one planet down here. Um, they will every once in a while have a great awakening and then flood out. And can be very, very dangerous. They're also quite hard to kill. Their planet is a very, very, very tough nut to crack. So, pretty dangerous we're not so close to them which is great and we're going to want to probably keep it that way um the hive have 135 plants wait this said 16.79 of the galaxy they have 33 you can see the hive are here they're here they're here they're freaking everywhere they don't work together there are individual hives but they're basically i mean you can just kind of imagine what they are they're the zerg or um i forget what they're called the uh, you know what they're called in Warhammer 40k, which actually I used to know better than calling them Zergs. Uh, Tyranids? Tyranids. Um, they are not necessarily strong, but they are a pain in the ass and they will constantly attack you. And they're difficult to invade, I think, as well. Um, but we're going to probably end up fighting them. We're going to probably end up fighting some of these guys. We'll see. But for now, we shall do nothing. Now we got our summary over here. We got prestige, planets, blah, blah, blah. And beginning of an era, strategic weapons, which we can use um, in certain situations. And imperial projects. When this reaches 100, we build a wonder, basically. Um, we're not going to worry too much about looking into this. And then in to win, well, first of all, to lose, prestige falls to zero. Or you lose control of Terra. We've got to be careful about that. To win, we need 12 of these glorious achievements accomplished. So there's quite a bit to do. We have also ruler of the galaxy. I don't actually know how you crown yourself. Ah, okay, yeah. You have to fulfill the 12 glorious achievements and then crown yourself and survive for 15 turns without losing these. All right, we're done with the empire screen. Before we, oh, well, also, the one thing that's going to happen next turn, and this happens every 15 turns, I think, is you have an audience where we kind of lay out some directives and deal with some issues. Okay, before we go into the next steps, we're going to talk a little bit about what's up here. Prestige, we already talked about. The only actual in-game thing that I've noticed uh, making a difference, having this higher, besides not losing, is it can give you more stormtroopers, uh, the ability to invade planets faster and more planets. Okay. 
Number of population. Population can roughly translate into money and power, you know, and just your, your standard fare there. Happiness affects loyalty and rebellion. So rebels, if this reaches 100%, there is a major rebellion on your hands. And that rebellion is determined by the rebel power. Right now, rebel readiness is 20%, rebel power 20. The happier and the more loyal your planets are, uh, the lower the rebel power will be. As well as I think it reduces how quickly um, rebel readiness goes up. Though I don't know the exact calculations here. I mean, it kind of kind of tells you how loyal your court is and how loyal your fleet is it makes a big difference in this as well. And um, your stability, which I think is, I've only seen affected by having uh, a court that is out of balance. Right. That's why this is so important. Up next, we've got money. We can see here we're losing 19% of our income to credits, uh, to corruption. That's a lot. This is why you want to get corruption down, right? It's it's somewhat difficult to do. And I wonder, we made some changes. We got rid of some more corrupt people. I wonder, this is at 19% now, how much it will change going to next turn. If we can remember, let's try and do that. If I forget, maybe you can ask me... Um, or just point, like, maybe I'll mouse over it and I'll forget to compare it. I don't know. Try and point it out to me, though. It's going to be too late for us to actually make a difference, so you don't have to say, hey, remember to do it, because I'm going to record several episodes right now. But just, just bring it up, no. But basically, this turns into money. What do you do with money? There's a couple of things. One, events. There's a lot of events that will happen that you can use money to have better um, results from or just not bad results colonization and then you can subsidize certain planets for certain things that that's it but it's you know you'll spend your money over here we have food coverage so there is no like number of food it's how covered you are in food we're at 116 percent right now over a hundred percent every four percent we get additional happiness below 100 percent we get unhappiness as well as slowing population growth so right now we're maxed out we're gaining four happiness as well cool 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 Electricity coverage. This is what we get from gas refining. This is why we switched to refining. Because I'm really, really fond of having high electricity coverage. Because what does it do? Well, if you have 100% or more, all industries except refining get just flat 1% bonus to output. It's okay. I don't usually care about getting to 100%. If 90% or less, factories get minus 10% to output. So all of your factories, which is how you make ships and maintain ships, is less. So we, I really like to stay above 90. If 80% or less, ships require one turn or more to be built or repaired. That is a significant thing because the way that the ships are built, it's, you know, it happens kind of automatically and then they get distributed and knocking a turn off of that can make a big difference. 70% or less mines give less output. Basically, I like to keep this over 90%. And if we can get it to over 100, I'm also I'm also happy about that. I actually started with a higher base than I did my previous game. And maybe we didn't need to switch it, but I'm still pretty happy that we're going to do that. Minerals you convert into ships when being produced. So how much factories you have is what I found to be the actual limit, though you do have to be careful because if you run out of minerals, then you're not going to build any ships. I found that at a certain point, I was just making so many minerals that it didn't matter. But, um, you know, I think every game might be a little bit different. And then here we have our research points. You get more from blue stars, which is pretty interesting. And uh, I actually did not <laughs> notice that. Also, just more population, more planets, and um, modifiers make a big difference as well finances here we set our taxes we can see how much we're losing to corruption and all that i found that i mean it doesn't make like a huge difference to change this i mean if you go to very low we're going from seven almost 1800 to 2000 it's it's 200 per turn is just not a whole lot and i sometimes will use this to boost up my happiness for now we're going to leave it as is then we've got our budget Basically, you have a certain amount of points. It's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. You have 12 total points, and you can distribute that in any which way that you want, and you spend no money. If you spend more than that, then you have to start spending cash. So if I, like, for example, boost this up and say I want 10% more research points on generation, 
a uh, research point generation, it's going to cost me two additional budget points, which cost me 870 credits per turn. I'm still going to do it. I'm still going to do it because I think research is very important, like in all games. So we're going to boost that up. But like, for example, you might want to say we need more defense. Maximum defensive installations on planet at maximum infantry. Basically, if somebody attacks your planet, you have defensive installations. So even if there's no fleet there, it can defend itself. And you can boost this to 80. Um, and doubles the reinforcement speed. So if you're beleaguered, you can change this. If you need your fleets to have more accuracy, you can change this. Though it's very expensive. If you want more Imperial communication range, okay, we're not going to worry about that again. If you want more claims, which is basically how, uh, I mean, how strong of a claim you have to a planet. And if you take it, somebody else might have claims there and they might want that planet. And this will kind of determine how they attack you. Um, some people don't care. The primitives will just attack you and claims don't matter. But um, the other people, it does matter. Science, we already went over. Infrastructure, more local planetary budget or less, which is how quickly your planets build their buildings. Um, because you don't control that, right? We don't control that. We kind of determine what we prefer, but we don't actually control that. Also, more Imperial project points, only half. Um, it's not a whole lot, but it's something that we might consider doing. And then finally, we get bonus prestige from the Imperial Palace or stronger Imperial Guards because people are going to try and kill us being the Emperor. Finally, there are contracts. Also, it should be noted that you have a limited amount of budget changes per era, per 30 years. We're going to use one to boost our science. We already used it. The rest we're going to leave as is. We're already spending an extra 870, so we're going to make a lot less money. We're only going to make 1,000 now instead of, you know, almost 2,000. Next up is industry. This is where you kind of decide where you want to have your governors focus their building. Since we have such high agriculture, I'm right away going to lower that. I don't think we need to... I mean, we're getting minus... Actually, because we're getting minus 25% right away, because I switched off of agriculture into refining, let's chill and see what happens. But basically, you can kind of use this to set up in the future. Like, if I want to boost my electricity coverage, really the biggest way that I'll do that is setting this higher. If I want to boost services, which gives you money, manufacturing, which gives you factories, mines and farms, we already kind of understand, as well as showing us what rare resources we have. So right off the bat, you can see I've got some hydrogen, Imperial communication range, cool, cool, cool. And we got 3x uranium. This is probably why we have so much more energy than I'm somewhat used to. We also have no Braxium, okay, whatever. We got Tritanium. Factory outputs increased by 5% because, I mean, it only goes up by 1%. There's also further bonuses that we can get from this later on. Capurium, factory output increased by 5% and gets further bonuses. Technological resources, ship production decreased by 2% and it stacks. We don't have these. We're not going to worry about them. And then there's luxury resources. This just makes you happier, basically. First source gives 15, the next one gives 10, and then 5 after that. Cool, we got a bunch of them. Nice. Not gonna worry too much about this, but sometimes you might be like, I want Braxium, and so I'm going to target somewhere. I really want increased damage versus bio hulls, which we do want, so we're gonna wanna kind of pay attention to where that is. There's only eight sources. We don't know where it is, we don't have any. With this one, there's 10 sources. We know where one is, but we don't have any. Okay, fair enough. That's industry. Next up is research. So the way that research works is you can, you have these five fields and you put a certain amount of points split into everyone. It can be totally even. You can set a primary, which gives it half or secondary, which gives it a quarter. I find it's always best to have a primary set and a secondary and work towards one goal. And then when you hit it, you want to kind of reshuffle a little bit. Now we start with all level one through three sociology techs. This is one of the things that we started on. I'm very happy about it. Additional uh, luxury, just plus 10. And luxury per level of electronics. We have none for that right away. Additional security affects planet loyalty and happiness. Cool. Ambassadors, higher chance for a diplomatic opportunity. Audience event, great. Agents, plus three to spying. I don't really know what the spying does. So I'm not going to worry too much about that. 
5% bonus to research that we just get right off the bat. That's really nice. And a 50% chance that new Imperial official military and civilian have a bonus to competence. Great. Um, plus 5 to happiness and doubled influence per turn gained over minor races. So we will use influence to get the minor races to kind of do things for us. Now we have to set what we want next. Video games in kindergartens gives 10% bonus uh, to point defense or toy soldiers bonus to ground combat. Or alien foo, 12% bonus to ground combat, which is way more than this. Or 20% bonus to imperial guards. I'm going to select this one, right? And as you go up, you need one of the tier to unlock the next tier and on, etc., etc. So you're usually not going to get too many of the same one. Um, so this is kind of why it's nice. We just got so much right off the bat. I really do think that it's quite powerful. And we're probably not going to focus on this because we have so much already. So we'll go back. Up next is construction. Construction is often the new ship hulls. You don't really design ships. You just get new and better ships that have specific roles and we'll kind of look at the the fleets as we get to them i think we're going to go with advanced hulls these give the stronger ability to protect capital ships basically giving you fighter cover and then this one has a communication array which also has bonuses we're going to go right for that one just right into it you know when we get to it we'll kind of we'll, we'll dig deeper energy the first one is just theory you just need to get energy one to really like that kind of design but uh we're going to focus on that Eventually, energy will give us shields and advanced PD and better energy and some hulls and things like that. Um, it is quite good. Electronics, there's also only one choice. 5% bonus to accuracy for everything. Pretty pretty simple decision there. Um, biochemistry, we can get combat medics, bonus to ground combat, or 3% research points per turn. I do really like the research points. Thrusters are also good. I don't know about the tractor beam calculation. I don't really like there's tractor beams, which makes a difference. And this makes you stronger against them. Great. Armor one is quite nice, probably making your ship stronger. I think we're just going to go with the 3% research points, though. And I mean, a little bit better at ground combat. Sure. And we have now picked everything. The question is, what are we going to go for? I'm going to go for brain. Um, actually, we're going to focus on construction with a secondary and brain chemistry. Because the sooner we can unlock better ships, the sooner we can add them to our fleets, and they are quite good. They're nice. They're nice to have. So there's your science, research. Finally, we have fleets. So we have all of these fleets, and we can see them laid out here, right? This, for example, there's a certain fleet over here. Squadron 605. Squadron 603, all belonging to Fleet 6 Border Guard Purple. Up here, we probably got another Border Guard. Border Guard Yellow, indeed, right? Guarding our borders. Every border is being guarded at this very moment. There's a, this, th these all belong to this one, by the way. You can see how much bigger Border Guard Yellow is. This is probably Border Guard Green. Indeed it is. And... I think that we already looked at uh, Border Guard Orange? No. It's possible. Yeah, there you are. We also have yeah, Border Guard Purple. You're just hanging out there. We also have the Mobile Defense Force. So this one is offensive and autonomous. Autonomous fleets are an interesting thing. And I'm not great at using them defensively. But offensively, they work quite well. Um, we also have one more fleet on Terra. Terra has the Imperial Armada. And the Terra Honor Guard. So we're going to probably make this autonomous as well. Let's now go look into it. So let's go look at... Uh, this is an autonomous fleet. And this is an autonomous fleet, right? We got 141 ships in active duty. Nothing en route. Nothing inactive. Nothing in reserve. We've got our squadrons, which we can affect. We can say, make them stronger. We can add additional squadrons to the individual fleets. We have different officers with competency and loyalty. You can see here, rather competent and very loyal. Great. Less competent, pretty loyal. Even less competent, less loyal with a lot. Like the more, these guys are commanding the individual squadrons. These two are commanding from the top down. A political officer tends to boost loyalty quite a bit. 
And we've got all these fleets. And then we have empty ones. Fleet 9? What are you? Oh, you're the Terra Honor Guard. That's that's true. Um, so we can, like, build additional fleets and then do things with them later. Like, right now, you have no nothing, nobody there. Um, we might also want to consider, like, removing people with low competency and loyalty. Which, since you have low competency and loyalty, you are also very incompetent and not very loyal. I'm actually going to talk to this guy and say, Hey, man, I need somebody better. So I'm going to summon him to the court. You can only do this to one per audience section. And then we're going to end up replacing this admiral. And then we've got orders. So this is the autonomous fleet. You give a generic order, which board to protect, which planet to conquer. They decide how to distribute it. They can create and disband and reorganize squadrons. Travel time of ships is always one. This is incredible. And this is why the autonomous fleets are incredibly powerful to use as um, defense response fleets and aggressive fleets. Because if I say wanted to move, you guys are not autonomous. If I wanted to move this guy to the border, it's gonna take six turns. One, two, three, four, five, six. If I say, hey, give a conquest order, in one turn, that fleet that's autonomous will show up here. Which is absolutely insane and really necessary. So we're going to make use of our autonomous fleets. And in fact, I'm going to make you... I'm probably going to create... Um, or I'm going to mess with the details. Hold on. I'm going to add a couple more. Because these things give a bonus to accuracy. I'm going to add two of these to your fleet. And I'm going to add two of these to your fleet. Why do I do that? Well, they give a tactical bonus. And here we can kind of see. So the way that the, the combat is kind of set up is you've got your smaller ships. Every one of these are different hulls. And they all have different particular feats and statistics and bonuses. Hornet Corvettes, for example, are cheaper. They also have a little bit of ability to protect capital ships. Falcon... Bonus damage versus Corvettes, and they can protect capital ships. The Lance of Ferry, double chance for a critical hit, and protects capital ships. The Aerial, they carry some fighters. They give a bonus to accuracy and a tactical bonus from one to four friendly ships. So having a few of these, I'm actually going to go up to four. They will give a, bo a tactical bonus, and I actually don't know what that does, <laughs> if I'm going to be honest. Um, we'll give... This bonus to the ships. And then we got our, our battleship here. They also give tactical bonuses. And they have this command bridge. Escort coverage protects capital ships. Which can be very, very important. If it's 100%, they will take extra critical hit chance. And additional damage from enemy fighters. Command bridge. The ratio of command bridges to a number of ships is too low. There is a penalty. A penalty to accuracy. Finally, Communication Array. This does give a penalty to accuracy. We don't have the ability to do anything about that, though, right now. And you know what? I had said that I was going to add these guys in. The Battleship gives a big bonus to a lot of ships. We don't need the aerials. I actually did not realize that. And I'm just going to... We're not going to build any new ships right now. How about that? Um, maybe we order a new one. What we are going to do... So we have, let's hold on a second. You are now autonomous. And I'm probably, we, we're going we're gonna to decide who goes when and where. I will say maybe give me an additional squadron. Give me four offensive squadrons. Okay, wow, 34 minutes in, and we are done with the descriptions of most of the things. Uh, we are going to want to kind of figure out where we're going to go, and who we're going to start moving against, and who we're going to start colonizing. Because colonization is huge. And now, the way we want to do that, because you always want to have a defense fleet on a border. Pirates will spawn and attack you at certain points. So you need to have something defending there. Like, like we do right now. So as we expand, it's kind of important. You want to like move to where you can limit 
the defense fleets needed. So if we, for example, expand onto Sphinx, it costs money to colonize. It has a lot of food and it has uranium. So this is a great place to move. And it will take where we have two fleets defending and we'll only need one, which is really nice. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna spend the money right now. One of the reason why we start with this extra money is we can colonize a bunch right off the bat. Ikea over here, for example, you got some silicoid. Okay, you have no natural resources, but that's okay because I can tell you, hey man, I want you to go into manufacturing, for example, or services. Give me money, give me more factories. I think we're going to have it as balanced, but you can kind of decide that. We don't really need to worry about all of these numbers right now, um, but it is, you know, additional resource. And again, it's an easy place to move into and, and to then further defend. It does not take an additional fleet in which we do not have. Um, which is quite nice. Same thing over here. And this place has a nice spread of a lot of things. You have agricultural specialization. I'm going to say be balanced here. And we're going to just say colonize. You give me some, some OX essence, more happiness. Great. Because then I can just move this guy here. And I don't have to worry about expanding or anything like that. We do border the hive down in this direction. And they will also expand. We border these guys. These are the Tal, what are they, Tal Max. We're gonna consider, I'm gonna take a look a little bit off camera at some diplomacy stuff and we're gonna kind of figure out um, where we're gonna move with that so that way we can take a little bit less time. But we're probably gonna want to move against one of our neighbors here. Uh, another very good location here. It's not the greatest planet. People have some claims on it, so we would potentially piss people off. It's got a little bit of minerals. But it's not particularly exciting to move into. And I think that's all of our potential colonization possibilities. Just down in... I mean, this is really the direction in which we're going to go. There's a bunch of resources. There's ancient ruins, which gives a chance for archaeology events. Kind of looking for something... Like a strategic resource. We don't want to get necessarily near the parasites because they are going to explode at some point. But I think we're still going to do it. So yeah, we'll colonize out in this direction. And I think we're going to colonize in this direction too. And over time, it's just going to happen. We don't do it. We just spend the money. We send it off. And then we'll get it in a couple of turns. For our foreign policy, like I said, I'm going to figure this out outside of this episode and i think we're gonna we're gonna put a cut in here this has been a very long-winded description but it is an old game and i did want to kind of describe a lot of the things next turn we're gonna start playing once we do play the game does go a lot quicker um because i mean a lot of the decisions you make you don't have to make so many of them and i'm not going to be explaining all of this stuff so the game is going to start progressing rather quickly um i assure you if you guys like this episode and you like this game, give it a like. Let people know it's out there. It's a great way to help out the algorithm and help out the channel if you want to support me in that easy way. I greatly appreciate it. I do have a Patreon if you want to support me in that way as well. Um, quick shout out to my two patrons. The first time I've ever said patrons instead of patrons. So kudos to me. Daniel Barra Sabo. Sabo. I always forget. My bad. Uh, Pasukaro and Ramgar MT. Much appreciated. They are of the builders tier or higher. So they get a shout out on most important videos all important videos first episodes for example and then randomly as well there's some other perks for that and um i've got a discord i've got twitter i've got a twitch channel you can check all that stuff out subscribe if you want to know when these videos come out probably gonna these series are gonna be every other day um but i got lots of other stuff which if you like this game you might want to check out so be sure to hit that like button that subscribe button and hit the bell if you want to be notified when those videos come out and that's it for the spiel. I'm really excited to play this game. It's like I, I, I got really sucked into it. Um, I'd heard about it a long time ago. So I'm really pumped to further explore it and check it out. And I'm excited to have you guys along with me as my kind of um, my brain trust here behind the scenes. Give me advice if you've got it. Like I said, I know the game a little bit, but not so much. Um, and uh, I look forward to to seeing you again as we take on the challenge of expanding an empire in an overall hostile world, uh, galaxy, without getting assassinated, 
without dealing with massive rebellions, without dealing with corruption. Can we be a good can we be a good emperor? We'll find out next time. And until then, my name is Man the Maker. Take care everybody. Have a wonderful day.